God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents, in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So we hear a text from the Gospel of John. Yeah. 
The reading is from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. It's on page 883 of your pew Bible. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Some of you uh, got bubbles when you came in. You can do that whenever, but especially when we sing. By that, I mean blow, you know, bubbles. Whenever the Spirit moves you. Could have been during that waltz we just sang, right? Like, you could have gotten up and danced. You can blow bubbles. The, um, so those, whatever they were, they came out at the beginning of worship. We're not sure what to call them yet. Pastor Karen has a name for them. I believe they're Jesus Whirly Gigs. Was that right? Jesus Whirly? Something. Anyway, those worked very well to let us know this is a service that's unlike most because we're talking about the Spirit being gifted to us. So today is Pentecost. Uh, After a week of weeks celebrating the resurrection of our Lord, we come to this day when the church remembers how that resurrection of our Lord changes us. And the whole world, not just us, but the whole world through us. As I read the gospel text that Judy just read in preparation for today, well, I saw that six weeks ago, on the second Sunday of Easter, I accidentally preached a Pentecost sermon. Sorry. (laughs) The gospel text for that Sunday was also from John chapter 20. It also started with John's 20th chapter, 19th verse, but it didn't stop at verse 23 like it did today. So it continued on with the story of how the disciple Thomas was not there when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then Thomas was not there when Jesus showed the rest of the disciples the wounds in his hands and his side. And as I look back at it, I, the resource that pastors use, it's called Sundays and Seasons, that tells us about what the upcoming week is about. I was supposed to dwell more on how even amid doubt, we experience resurrection. If you were there that week, uh, you might remember. I did talk about that for sure, but then I spent a lot more time on one of the most misinterpreted verses in the whole Bible, John 20, verse 23, which we just heard read again as the last word of the text. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And that verse just has never sat right with me. And I know I'm not alone. It just doesn't fit with the rest of the Gospel of John. In John's very first chapter, when we meet John the Baptist, lots of people are asking John the Baptist, who are you? Are you Elijah? Because they've been looking for Elijah. They've been waiting for Elijah. Are you a prophet? And John the Baptist is like, well, I'll tell you this, I'm not the Messiah. And then the very next day, when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming his way, he declares, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not the sins of some, notice, but the sin of the world. It's the same gospel that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, not to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And then in story after story after story, John's gospel shows what that looks like. A Gentile Roman soldier whose child is ill. In the faith of Jesus, that Gentile Roman soldier sees his child made well. A crowd of thousands who are hungry get fed by Jesus, and Jesus doesn't even require identification or a faith statement or any qualification to be included in the meal. This Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world speaks peace 
to disciples who are afraid, restores a man born blind to community. He even talks to a woman, a stranger woman at a well, which leads to bringing a bunch of Samaritans, of all people, to faith. These are episodes of For God So Loved the World Indeed. So there's all these stories that show what it means that this word made flesh has come to take away all the sins of all the world. But then we get to this moment, this post-resurrection moment in this upper room where the risen Jesus appears to the disciples to go to the effort of showing them his wounds and speaking peace to them again. And after everything that's happened, after all that God's been up to for millennia since the birth of faith with Abraham and Sarah, Jesus does this amazing thing. He breathes the Holy Spirit of God onto, into these disciples. God, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, through the perfect faith of Jesus, has shown God to be love, to be mercy, to be forgiveness, and to be for all. And after all that, verse 23 in English, in our NRSV translation, verse 23 says in our pew Bibles, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. Which sounds a lot like, here's the spirit, guys. The spirit of love, mercy, and forgiveness for all. Now, forgive or don't. It's up to you. I'm out. Like, what? That is how the church has interpreted this 23rd verse of the 20th chapter for a long time. That the church has been graced with God's spirit in order to forgive or not. We've interpreted this verse to mean it's up to us to judge what is forgivable and then forgive the sins of any or retain them. Which made me ask six weeks ago, so if that's the case, then which sins are we supposed to not forgive? Retain. And why those? And who says so? Who has the wisdom to decide which sins to retain and which ones to forgive? And why wouldn't Jesus say more about this retaining of sins? I I said, this is the gospel-changing thing to say in the Gospel of John, and that's all he has to say about it? And that's when I dropped some Greek, not my own Greek knowledge, because I don't have much of that, but a translation of the original text according to Sandra Schneider's, who does have Greek expertise. Her translation, a little clunkier, but that's because ancient Greek doesn't just act like this word equals that English word, or this phrase equals those English words together. So she translates this verse to say, of whomever you forgive the sins, the sins are forgiven to them. And whomever you hold fast, she likes hold fast better than retain. And she says, this is the really important part, the thing that's being retained, the thing that's being held fast, It's not the sins. It's the person who did the sin. Whomever you hold fast to, whomever you embrace, whomever you stick with, that person is held fast, embraced, stuck with by you. So yeah, when you forgive sins, those sins are forgiven. Jesus breathes his Holy Spirit on his disciples in order that they understand they have the power to forgive. Like, really forgive. But that's not the secret sauce of Pentecost. Jesus showed in story after story after story that to open someone to faith, faith being a relationship with God, Jesus was not only willing to forgive all kinds of people, he was willing to stick with all kinds of people. He'd hold fast to a person. And eventually that person would see, believe, That's the secret sauce. Here's the Holy Spirit. Now know that you have the power to forgive sins and everything you need to stick with people through their doubts, through their process of coming to belief and remaining in belief. Whomever you stick with, whomever you hold fast to, is held fast. 
Jesus knew he wasn't going to be able to do all the sticking with by himself. There's a lot of us. And so he deputizes his disciples to forgive sins. He deputizes his disciples to hold fast to others. He breathes his Holy Spirit on them to be little Christs in their worlds, sticking with doubters and haters and idolaters and sinners. In other words, sticking with people. Having brought people to belief, he tasks his believers first with peace, then with the ability to forgive and the responsibility to stick with those who need to be stuck with. And I asked then, so who in your life needs you to stick with them? I invited you to try to remember who has stuck with you. And I heard some great stories about people who stuck with you, or maybe who still stick with, are sticking with you. But I also asked, who in your life needs you to stick with them? That they may persist in belief, or maybe come to belief. That they would see the Lord maybe for the first time, or maybe for the first time in a long time. And I heard such a wonderful variety of responses to that question. I heard from one who told me about their spouse who's had a rough couple years as friends have died and fam multiple family are ill and neighbors are struggling. And the primary role of this person has always been to be helpful by doing things for people. But in the face of all the stuff that's going on in pretty much every part of their life, they're just... There isn't much for them to do. And so they're feeling pretty useless and pretty helpless. Like, what is there to say? Uh, what is there to do? Seeing a spouse feel helpless has led that spouse to also feel hopeless. And hopeless, to me, that's a description of forgetfulness. We followers of Jesus can only be hopeless when we forget when we don't do the work of remembering our own stories of how God has shown up in the most barren places, the most lost places. And those stories happen, yes, in the Bible, but they also happen in our own lives. I've heard you tell those stories. And so, you know what we can do with that hopeless spouse in our lives? Stick with them. Having had God's Spirit breathed on us, Okay, poured on us at baptism, as Charlie will have the Holy Spirit poured on him in just a moment. Having that Spirit poured on us, we can in faith stick with the hopeless. I, I heard about a friend who is apparently angry at God, angry for big issues like the truth that bad things happen to good people, like natural disasters, human disasters. I believe a mass shooting was what they were referring to when I heard this story. That God allows that kind of thing to happen. And there was also a car accident that had changed this friend's life too. Well, what is there to say about that kind of stuff? What is there to be done about the randomness, the chaos of this broken world? When Jesus account encounters the chaos, when bad things happen to him, a good person... According to Matthew and Mark's Gospels, he quotes a psalm of lament. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer. By night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. There's anger in lament. Jesus shows us God can take anger. I also hear in that psalm remembering. Yet you are holy. You delivered our ancestors in the past. What can we do with that angry friend in our lives? Stick with them. In faith, the, in the kind of patience that Jesus offers person after person after person, we can patiently stick with them too. In response to my own question, I thought about people in my life who are simply apathetic to faith, their relationship with God. Some who just don't seem to really care one way or the other, faith or no faith, whatever. Or maybe it's I'm too busy to attend to that 
faith relationship with God, definitely too busy to do church stuff, or maybe I just mistrust the church as an institution so much that I stay away. Whatever the reasons, I hear and assume often of many in my life, my relationship with God, if there is one at all, remains at kind of the same place it was when I was 10 or 13 or somewhere in there. Well, can you imagine if any other significant relationship in your life remained where it was when you were 10 or 13? Like, some of us, that's a while ago. (laughs) Thriving relationships grow, change, become layered, become messy, become beautiful. All of it. So, what is there to say to someone who just doesn't seem to really care? What is there to do? Stick with them. Until those moments, because those moments come for all of us, when we might have the opportunity as we stick with them to share our own stories, maybe remind them of their own stories, definitely invite them into a, a safe faith community like ours. Sticking with people is what Pentecost is for. In that moment, Whatever it looked like. We have a story from Acts about tongues of flame appearing over their heads, and we have this story from the Gospel of John talking about Jesus breathing on them. The point is that God upgrades human purpose at Pentecost to go from living in fear toward inevitable dead-end death to living this life beyond death, knowing that death lost. A new creation has begun, And so the whole experience of life functions differently. The relationship between God and God's people in Christ has changed. So that in Christ, people can forgive. People can stick with. Their whole lives long. With anyone. Anytime. There's no restrictions on how we can love each other. Pentecost is about our purpose. And our freedom to love as God loves persistently rather than to judge as humans want to judge. And for that freedom, we say, thanks be to God. Amen. And so I invite you to stand and blow bubbles as you sing. (laughs) 